five reasons why we left the U.S. So about a year ago, we left the U.S. and moved to Portugal. Within this year, I've been asked, why did you leave the U.S.? Roughly about 20 times. And my answer has always been a bit of a nuanced, but very truthful answer. And it's the fact that the U.S. is currently a shit show and I'm tired of being a part of the circus. As a millennial, we have the saying, the American dream is now to actually leave the U.S. Because staying actually turns into the American nightmare. So let's go ahead and get into the top five reasons why my family and I left the United States. Number one, first and foremost, safety. Safety was the number one reason that we left. With all the violence and random, I mean, just random acts of violence, uh, but also <laughs> ones that were actually premeditated. Basically, you at the mercy of whether or not something bad would happen to you. And it was getting to the point that even if walking down the street, you didn't feel safe anymore. And we got tired of worrying about safety. I mean, there have been incidents from road rage. There have been incidents from uh, involving movie theaters, restaurants. It, it was just getting so bad to the point that it was time to go. Now, I also mentioned that there is a part of a racial component that I like to discuss in the safety aspect. Uh, but... I mean, even just my normal interactions day to day, for the most part, it was okay. But I have had some racist incident, inc incidents to where I actually fit for my life. I agree. There are racist assholes everywhere across the globe. However, to me, it's more so the fact that with racism in the U.S., I actually have to worry about it being lethal, meaning that I can be murdered from a just racist person. And even the more so ingrained into my brain because my family was actually a survivor of the, of the Rosewood Massacre in 1923. So outside of dealing with the races in my home country, I've traveled to many other countries, including Australia. I lived there for a year. I've been to the Caribbean. I've, I've been to Hong Kong. I've been uh, to France, the whole shebang. So I've been all over the place, Asia and even though I have had racist incidents, I never feared for my life, unlike in the U.S. The second part of safety I'll talk about, it actually deals with school shootings. Now, I have a two-year-old, I have a seven-year-old, and when my seven-year-old was getting ready to start kindergarten, we had massive heartburn. And it was mostly because, let's face it, a lot of these school shootings actually take place at public schools. Well, I will say he's about to enter the public school system. And for us, it was more of the heartburn of, oh, gosh, my kid's going to have to go through the active shooter drills. And for those that aren't in the U.S., active shooter drills are exactly what they sound like. Your child has to go through drills of a shooter coming on campus, what to do, where to hide, what children are supposed to protect the other children when the teacher can't protect them, and etc. So that was driving us crazy, knowing that our, school, our kid was going to have to deal with that. And so, you know, we, we had to think of other options outside of the U.S. because we couldn't live like that. Now, I want to caveat this by saying that I myself had never had to go through an active shooter drill. I graduated, I'm kind of predated myself, but I graduated high school in 1999, which was actually the first year of, I guess, a, a nationwide shooter that happened on campus, and that was the Columbine shooting. So since this shooting in Columbine, over 25 years, there has been a significant increase of shootings. Now, according to the White House, there have been over 400 school shootings since then. Roughly 370,000 students have been availed to gun violence in school. And according to an article from CNN, school shootings have increased year over year, except in 2020. And you know why it didn't happen in 2020? Because of COVID. Everything was shut down. 
So needless to say, we actually couldn't bear putting our children through that. And we knew that, especially if we have a better option, even if the option required us being a bit uncomfortable, leaving, going to another country and et cetera, we had to explore that option. Also, just to put the safety aspect in context, we currently live in Portugal, which is number seven on the Global Peace Index, which actually measures the level of societal safety, security, and etc. The U.S., you never guess. It's number 131. That shows the drastic difference of how safe a country is, and the U.S. is horrible. But growing up in the U.S., you, you become, you kind of become numb to it from seeing all the violence. But when you live outside and you go outside and, and to another country and, and you have those experiences, you realize how bad things are in the U.S. So, moving on. The second reason of why we left was the cost of living. Now, everyone talks about the cost of living uh, because everything is getting just so expensive in the United States. And when I say expensive, I'll give you a bit of an example. So, just to kind of level set, I am a licensed attorney. My wife made pretty good money as well. She was the head of compliance program at a tech firm. We were, I would say, probably the top 5% of all income earners in the U.S. Even with that, living in Tampa, Florida, we felt like we were living paycheck to paycheck. i give you just briefly some of our expenses in, in Florida. So for a three-bedroom, two-bathroom town, two townhouse, we paid $3,200 a month. And mind you, when we left, they raised the price of that same townhouse to $3,700 a month. Our utilities were about $500 a month, which included, of course, water and electricity. Cell phone, 100 bucks. Now, I, I caveat that because we were grandfathered in. We had that same plan for about 10 years. So over a decade. I know a lot of people were like, oh, $100 is a good deal. <laughs> but I want to at least state that. Then health insurance is about $800 a month. And that's for a family of four. And I, I, I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, further down our list while we left. But that was heavily subsidized by my employer. I mean, heavily subsidized. So I had a good health insurance and a lot of people don't, don't have the opportunity to have such a, a massively subsidized plan where the employer pays the bulk of the insurance premiums. Daycare for two kids, $2,000 a month. So here in Portugal, on the other hand, we have a three bedroom, two and a half bath townhouse. We Pay roughly eleven hundred a month. Electricity, because we're in a colder area, we had to pump that heat because we're from Florida, so we we enjoy being a bit warm. Is was five hundred dollars a month during the winter, during the summer because we didn't have AC, it was quite a bit lower. Our internet was forty five euros a month, which is about fifty bucks, and that includes. Uh, high speed up to 500 megabytes per second. And then also, it included our phone line. We have a cell phone with two lines, unlimited data. It's 51 euros a month. And before we were paying 100. Our daycare and, cool, and, and schooling expenses for our two kids have been sliced in half. Car insurance, 200 bucks. Health insurance, about 245 year olds for a family of four. So we're saving at least three grand a month just based off of today's conversion rate. So the third reason we left is healthcare. And I'm sure people in the US, you know, you, you hear these stories all the time about people going bankrupt from having to pay their medical bills and et cetera. I don't know how pervasive that news is in other countries outside of the U.S., but it is a thing. And I'll actually go through some of the expenses that we've had, like for the birth of our daughter and et cetera, that were crazy and outrageous. As I mentioned before, my 
employer partially paid for my health health care plan. So we had a pretty good health insurance covered by my employer. And luckily, we didn't have any pre-existing conditions, which could exclude a lot of families from even getting a insurance or people getting from actually obtaining insur health insurance. And even with my employer-backed health plan for my family of four, we were paying, well, I would say, quoted $2,300, about $62 a month, of which I had to pay $800 out of pocket, and my employer paid the remaining balance, which is about $1,500. Bucks. Most people in the U.S. do not have that option, do not have such an op option that an employer will pay so much to sponsor their or subsidize their health insurance. So imagine paying over 2000 a month for health insurance in the, in the off chance that something happened. Now, like, as I mentioned, I'll give you an example of some of the bills we had. So for the birth of my daughter, we, were, we, had, we received a bill of $63,000. Now, luckily, I actually maxed out the deductible, but we still had to pay over $5,000 out of pocket. And like I said, that's just really because we had a really good health insurance from my employer. Another example that I had to research is actual cancer treatment, so chemotherapy. So chemotherapy treatment in the U.S. on average, from the study I saw, was about $150,000. In Portugal, for, a, for comparison, it's a tenth of that, so $15,000. So living in the U.S., you always have to worry about, you know, what if this catastrophic incident happens, um, i.e. I get in a car accident, I have chemotherapy, it's just life-saving procedures, am I going to be able to afford that bill? Am I going to have to file for bankruptcy because I, I can't afford to pay that huge medical bill that's coming? So, so that was a main component as well. So the fourth reason that I'll talk about is political system, and just base, basic government incompetency. Just to sum up this area, I'll just say that we only, in the U.S., if you're outside the U.S., we only have basically two political parties. And for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, they've been constantly bickering. But the last 20 years or so, it's been even worse. There's so much division, there's so much infighting that shit ever gets done. I mean, it's really bad. And because of this division, everything gets more polarized based off of the media, the infighting, and needless to say, nothing of significance has been accomplished for probably two decades. You can kind of say Obamacare was one of them, but let's face it, Obamacare has been gutted so much by Republicans that it's a shell of itself and it's basically shit now. So with all this corruption in the political system, and I, I will say I do know about this because I'm a political science major. I have a bachelor's degree in that. I've been following it for uh, since I've graduated. And it's to me, it's kind of teeming with quite a bit of corruption, which no one wants to talk about. And we have in the U.S. what I call legal corruption which is lobbying in quotes. And basically these politicians are getting rich and becoming millionaires from all these backdoor deals and lobby deals and et cetera with all these businesses. Keep in mind that the salary for these politicians is only $150,000. Yet and still they're becoming millionaires from these massive backdoor deals. And because of it, it keeps eroding our political system. Everything becomes more divisive. They don't care about the public anymore, uh, the citizens. All they care about is lining their pockets. So it, it has gotten really bad and divisive. And with all this infighting, even some of our generals from the U.S. military have been worried about another civil war. And especially with this upcoming election, it could be a thing. If Trump doesn't win, or even if he does. So it's, it's, it was a major major concern for us, and we wanted to at least have an option to ride this out 
I mean, I love the U.S. I was born and raised there, but I understand that my priorities are my family. And so I needed to make sure that they're in a safe environment so that my kids can thrive and et cetera. And so we had to leave the U.S. So the fifth reason I'll talk about, I mean, there are a lot of the minor reasons, but the fifth one is this, I will say, with the top five is the actual work culture in the U.S. Now, granted, you do make tons of money. I, I ain't even going to sugarcoat it. You, you can make tons of money in the U.S. But what no one talks about is that you spend all that money. The living expenses and the cost of living has gone through the roof. You basically spend all your money on food, health care, and et cetera. And as I mentioned earlier, hell, we were making tons of money, and we feel like we was living paycheck to paycheck. And I think this system is actually by design. You're constantly on this perpetual hamster wheel, working, 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 just to survive. Unlike in other places where, you know, they actually value motherhood and taking time off and vacations so that you can kind of recharge your batteries. In the U.S., like if a woman gives birth, you get 12 weeks of unpaid leave, mandatory by law. And after that 12 weeks, a employer can be like, well, get your ass back to work. We don't care if you want to bond more with your child and et cetera and, 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 and have a peace of mind and get healthy and maybe you had some complications during birth or whatever. They don't give a shit, to be honest. We can talk about the vacation in the U.S. I'm sure a lot of people outside of the U.S. don't know that there's no vacation laws in the U.S. There's no mandatory vacation. It's all up to the employer. So if the employer provides paid vacation or not, or paid holiday, public paid holidays or not, it's at their discretion. So if an employer decides not to have any vacation or paid holidays, tough shit. You agree to that job and you got to deal with it. So in contrast, many other countries globally provides an average of anywhere between about 20 to 40 days of, of time off vacation by law. And that includes mostly federal holidays and vacation and all that kind of stuff. In the U.S., people basically work themselves to death because they can't, they can't get off the hamster wheel. And everything is getting so expensive, you just, you just keep going. You have to keep working. You can't take any time off. And it leads to burnout and, and this kind of, I guess, kind of lead to the quiet quitting and all that kind of stuff that's going on in the U.S. So it's a major issue in the U.S. culturally. And, you know, going abroad, you kind of see the differences of how countries deal with that and, and kind of make their employers have a bit more of a work-life balance, to be honest. And as a side note, my wife is actually from France. So, yeah, she's been in the U.S. for about 17 years or so, but she's always complained about the, the work-life balance and the culture in the U.S., particularly because she has knowledge of what goes outside of the U.S. and what, what, you know, what kind of happens on global and et cetera. So, you know, all this being said, we wanted to have a true work-life balance where we can actually enjoy the time of, of with our children, where they actually want to be with us because once they become teenagers, they probably don't want to hang, hang out with us anymore. And, you know, just enjoy that time. And in the U.S., the, the adage is you live to work instead of working to live. And that's, that's kind of what I see across the board. Overall, it took us about two and a half years to finally leave and the U.S. After many attempts and many restarts and et cetera, we finally, we finally made it. And, you know, we've tried transferring our jobs abroad and et cetera and researching all these different countries that have options of where you can actually go and easily obtain visas, either if you're a digital nomad or, or you, you have quite a bit of money that you can, from the sale of your house in the U.S. that you can dump in and, and, and buy another house and so you can get a visa by investment. But we looked at all these options and ultimately we landed in Portugal. So I'm telling you all this by just you know showing you example that it's possible and that you can actually find a way out. Even if it's a short term, one or two years, see how things go. And then you decide, okay, well, maybe I want to go back to the U.S. Or maybe I never want to go back because I do see some people on both sides of that spectrum. 
one thing I want to note is that if you do, if you, if you are considering this, build some flexibility in your timeline and opportunities, because you never know when an actual opportunity to move abroad will actually come and when you can actually leave the U.S. And I'm saying this from personal experience is that I've had a couple opportunities um, many, many times where I've actually turned them down because I felt like it wasn't the right time. But in hindsight, I was kicking myself for not taking an opportunity. Um, and, and for instance, I had some I had opportunity to, to work in Germany uh, right out of school. I had some opportunities to, to live in Australia and, and to actually stay after I finished my degree. So I I for, I gave up some of those opportunities and I kicked myself because it probably would have put me in a better situation to actually in to actually. I guess, fulfill my full potential without having to deal with all the issues in the U.S. I also want to say that I didn't have millions of dollars uh, to, to leave the U.S. and to start anew like a lot of these other YouTubers have. Uh, we left the U.S. and actually moved abroad with one job. My wife was able to kind of transfer her job into a consulting gig, and I quit my job because... I, I wanted to do what was best for my kids and the cost of living here was so low that we could kind of ride out for two years until I decide what other options I have. Maybe I get another job in here in Europe or maybe I create my own business, but it afforded me some opportunities because the cost of living was so low. So thank you guys for, for, for watching this long. If you have any questions or comments, just leave them down in the comment section below. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.